Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started here. Um, we're going to be finishing up Chapter 7 today, and it's going to be all math. So just get ready. It's going to be us doing some examples. I'll have you calculate some things. Um, stoichiometry, which is what 7.7 .7 through 7.9 are you know, called in chemistry lingo, is typically one of the harder topics, but it doesn't have to be. I would strongly encourage you to follow the same method that we do in class, and you will be successful in getting all these questions right. So it's about method versus um, just kind of sporadically trying to go at the problem. You have to have a strategy. Otherwise, you will get lost. Um, please don't forget that the homework from last week, the class participation from March 17th, there's been an extension on that, so if you have not submitted it, please make sure that you do. You can do so up to tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, March 25th. I am recording this lecture with my own software, so I'll be able to upload this to YouTube. So there's a channel um, that I've created for Dr. Hefner. You'll be able to see Chem 104 videos of all the lectures. So the last lecture that we did, I re-recorded with no audience and put it up there. So now it'll be a little bit more interactive since it'll be the live lecture, and you can watch it if you need to go back and reference something, or if someone has missed something, you missed a lecture, don't worry about it, you'll be able to tune in, okay? Um, so let me write the date on here. So this one is, change it, 03-24, 2020. Here we go. So the first part that we're going to talk about is mole relationships. So last week we talked about the mole, Avogadro's number. So if you need a refresher on that, we'll kind of do that as we go along. We're going to be able to write mole-mole relationships and use those as factors to figure out um, how much of a particular reactant is required or how much product you produce based on a given, um, like a known amount of reactant or product. And that'll make more sense in a minute. The reason we can make all of these calculations and do all this fancy stuff is because of the law of conservation of mass. What that pretty much means is matter cannot be created or destroyed. So the same mass that you have going into the reaction is the same mass you have coming out. So the mass of the products is equal to the mass of the reactants. So let's say that you had A plus B and you make C. If you have one gram of A and one gram of B, the amount of C that you make is equal to two grams. So there's always conservation of mass. That's why we can do all these funky mole calculations. This is just um, an example of, <coughs> excuse me, what it looks like. So let's say that you have this um, reaction which unfortunately collaborate, instead of doing the arrow, it's putting in this little pencil sign because it doesn't recognize the font. So anytime you see that weird pencil, I'll try to draw in the arrow, but that's what it means. It's the yield arrow in a chemical reaction. So if you have silver and sulfur and you make sulfur or and you make silver sulfide, so that's this last one over here. What you're going to see is if you add up the mass that's on the scale for silver plus the mass that's on the scale for the sulfur, it should equal the mass that's on the scale for the silver sulfide, the product. And this is a table that gives you, you can have a lot of information from a balanced chemical equation. So 
the equation that we were given is two silvers plus one sulfur gives you one silver sulfide. You can write this in terms of atoms. You could say two atoms of silver plus one atom of sulfide gives you one atom of the silver sulfide. With Avogadro's number, that's, you know, how many things we have. And Avogadro's number is, we'll just write this out, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if we have that many atoms times 2 for silver, and 6 point, this isn't going to fit in the box, so I apologize, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of the sulfur, we're going to get, again, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd silver sulfide atoms. So this is just some of the information. We can also look at moles. So from the reaction, you can say two moles of silver plus one mole of sulfur gives you one mole of silver sulfide. All of this is saying the mass of the reactant is equal to the mass of the products. So let's consider another reaction. And again, the internet doesn't recognize the arrow, unfortunately. If we have this reaction where we have iron and it's interacting with sulfur to make this iron 3 sulfide compound, we can actually read this as two moles of iron plus three moles of sulfur. We're just using the coefficients that are in front and then adding in moles. So you could say two moles, you could say two atoms, same thing. This is important because that means that we can write mole-mole factors from a chemical equation. So the mole-mole factor is a ratio of the moles for any two substances in an equation. So it relates the two. For iron and sulfur, you can write a mole-mole factor that looks like this. For every two moles of iron, you require three moles of sulfur. So the two came from the reaction, and the three came from the reaction. We can also flip this, just literally write the reciprocal, to write another mole-mole factor, where you have the sulfur on top, and the iron on the bottom. This is gonna be important when we're trying to do a conversion, if we're trying to figure out how much sulfur do we need to react with a certain amount of iron. Let's look at the relationship between the iron and the product. So for every two moles of iron, we make one mole of the product, the iron three sulfide. Remember that if you don't see a number in front, that means it's a one. The reciprocal would be one mole 
of iron 3 sulfide over 2 moles of iron. So why don't you give this last one a shot and then I'll write it out. Obviously it's a kind of a difficult thing to um <laughs> to put that into the chat box, but try it in your notebook or if you just have a, you know, scratch piece of paper or something just to see if you get the concept and then I'll pull you and see how many people got something like it. So take 30 seconds or so and try to write the two mole mole factors that relate sulfur and the product, which is iron three sulfide. So the first one that I would write would be three moles of sulfur for every one mole of iron, iron three sulfide. Then I'd write the reciprocal. And that's where you just flip it over and you say one mole of iron three sulfide for every three moles of sulfur. So by show of hands, how many people were able to get the two mole mole factors? It doesn't have to be in this exact order, but if you got both of them. Okay, we got one person. We got some more. Good. You can lower your hand. Hopefully we've got more people who maybe just didn't raise their hand. But please do um, try it. Try writing these mole mole factors. We're going to do more of this as we go on. We're building up our skill set right now. Ooh. So this slide did not translate very well. So this first question should say that you want a mole, mole factor for hydrogen and nitrogen. So give that a try. Figure out which one, A, B, or C, is representative of a mole mole factor for hydrogen and nitrogen. Once you have your answer, you can put it in the chat box, A, B, or C. One person saying A. Any other takers? A, B, or C? All right. So unfortunately, let's look at the problem. B. We're looking at B. So here's why. The coefficients have to match what's in the chemical reaction. So three goes with hydrogen, just like you see in the reaction. You have one mole of nitrogen, so there should be a one or a zero here, or not a zero, but a space. Remember, if there's no coefficient, it means one for the nitrogen. So B is a representative mole-mole factor for the relationship between hydrogen and nitrogen. So let's try number two. 
Which one of these could be a mole-mole factor for ammonia, which is the NH3, and hydrogen gas? Remember, we're looking for ammonia, which is NH3, and hydrogen. So let me do that in a different... Uh, we'll give hydrogen a different color. Make hydrogen purple. So we need to find something where the number of moles corresponds with the coefficients in the problem. Yeah, so we're looking for B. You've got two moles of NH3. Ah, I did the wrong color. I'm trying to be fancy. So we said NH3 is red, and there's two. The hydrogen we said was purple. There's three. So that's how you do those. You have to make sure that the number of moles corresponds with the coefficient, the number that's in front of whichever compound. Good. Now let's put this to work. We can write these mole-mole factors, but what do we use them for? We use them to convert number of moles of one compound to number of moles of another. So in this problem, the question asks, how many moles of iron two oxide or iron three oxide can form from six moles of oxygen? The way that we approach this is first, we rewrite the question. We have six moles of oxygen, and we want to know how many moles of the product do we make? So we rewrite the question always, always, always. Then we want to write a mole factor that describes this relationship. And we're trying to go from oxygen to iron three oxide. What we want needs to be on the top, and what we have already needs to be on the bottom. So that means what we want is moles of the iron compound. And what we have is moles of oxygen. Then you go to your chemical reaction and you fill in the coefficients. So for the iron, the iron three oxide, what number am I gonna fill in for the moles if I'm looking at the equation? You can write it in the chat box. We're looking at the iron three oxide. So that means to fill in the coefficient, we're gonna write a two here for our mole-mole factor. For oxygen, there's a three. So the same thing that we were doing with that practice, that's what we're doing here. We're writing a mole-mole factor. We want what we're trying to calculate on the top and what we already have on the bottom. Then you set up your problem. You set up your equation to solve it. 
We're starting with six moles of oxygen. And we're going to use our mole-mole factor to go from moles of oxygen to moles of product. When you do this, you end up canceling out the moles of oxygen so that you're only left with moles of your product. When you do this in your calculator, you're going to multiply 6 times 2 and then divide that by 3. Your answer should be 4.0 moles. My pen is struggling today, y'all. So we're going to do more examples of that, but let's walk through this one again. We started by rephrasing the question, and we wrote it down in a way that makes a little bit more sense with what we need to find. We have six moles of oxygen. We want to know how many moles of the product we'll make if we use all of those six moles of oxygen. Then we have to write a mole-mole factor. The mole-mole factor has what we want at the top and what we already have at the bottom. So what we want at the end of this is the number of moles of iron 3 oxide we can make. So we put two moles of iron 3 oxide because that's what our equation tells us, that we make two moles of iron 3 oxide for every three moles of oxygen gas. The three moles of oxygen gas goes on the bottom because that's the information that we already have. We already know something about oxygen, so we want to be able to cancel it out with our math. Then we set up our equation. And we take the six moles of oxygen that the problem gave us, the given information, and we multiply by our mole-mole factor. That should cancel out the moles of oxygen and leave us with moles of iron-3 oxide. You multiply six times two, divide by three, and you get four moles of iron-3 oxide. Let's do another one. So we have the same equation as before. Only this time, the question is asking, how many moles of iron are needed for the reaction of 12 moles of oxygen? So we have 12 moles of oxygen, question mark, moles of iron. I will frequently write M-O-L for moles. Um, most chemistry textbooks will use that abbreviation. It's shorter than writing M-O-L-E-S, so please forgive me if I do that. It's not consistent with your textbook, but I'm a chemist at heart, <laughs> so that is what I tend to do versus writing out the whole word. So if you see that, just know it means moles. I know I'm going to do it um, just because of space sometimes or because that's my default. Okay, so let's approach this problem. We said 12 moles of oxygen, and we don't know how many moles of iron we're going to require. Our equation, I'll go back to it, we need what we want at the top over what we have. What we want is the iron. What we have 
is the oxygen. So when we write our mole-mole factor, we're going to want to have moles of iron on the top and moles of oxygen on the bottom. So let's bring that forward. I don't think it's going to save it, so we'll see. Yeah, it didn't save it. That's okay. We'll rewrite it. Four moles of iron, three moles of oxygen, and we're again trying to go from 12 moles of oxygen to moles of iron. So now that we have our mole-mole factor, we take the 12 and we use our mole-mole factor to figure it out. We write it out four moles the top for iron, three moles at the bottom for oxygen, and we do our multiplication and division. So you multiply 12 times 4 and divide that product by 3. When you do that, you should get 16 moles. And that is answer number, uh, letter C. So we'll step through this one again, too. The question asks about how many moles of iron can we make or do we need to react with 12 moles of oxygen? Using our chemical reaction, the equation, we wrote out our mole-mole factor. What we want is the iron, so that's going to go on top. From the equation, we have a 4 for that coefficient. So it's 4 moles of iron. We go to the oxygen on the bottom because that's what we have information on. And from the chemical reaction, we know that 3 moles of oxygen gas react with 4 moles of, of iron. So that's how we write our mole-mole factor. Then you take the given information of how much oxygen we're starting with which was 12 moles, and then you multiply by your mole-mole factor, which was four moles of iron over three moles of oxygen. Oh no, that just erased. Ah, it's one of those days, y'all. Thankfully, the video has captured all of this. And what we got was that was 16 moles, which is C. What I wanted to show you was that you cancel out the moles of oxygen so that you're only left with moles of iron. So it's really important that you write out your units. No naked numbers. We don't want these numbers out here reckless. They need to have a unit. They need some kind of covering. So please, write a unit with your number. If you don't, you won't know what you're multiplying or dividing by, and you'll have no idea if you're actually answering the question. So... Sheradian, you asked where did the four and the um, and the three come from? They come from the chemical equation. So, the equation on the other page was um, this. So this is the chemical equation, and 
the four. It's from there. The three is from here. So for your mole-mole factor, you're always getting, you're taking the coefficient. In this case, for the iron, it's four. Then you're going to write moles iron. Oxygen, it's three moles of oxygen. Does that help? Okay, you're very welcome. So that's the first part. So we're using, we can write a mole-mole factor and use it to convert from moles of one compound to moles of another. The last class we had, we also talked about calculating molar mass, which was the mass of a compound or an element. We're going to combine what we've been what we just did with using molar mass to calculate um, the mass of reactants and products. So there's a very wordy um, way that they explain how to do this where you convert the mass of one one compound to the ma mass of another. We're just going to skip over that. It doesn't make sense to me to just read it. I think it's better if you see something. So this diagram is a little bit more helpful because it helps with unit analysis. So you're going to take grams of something, grams of A, and you're going to be multiplying by a molar mass factor. So that's the calculated molar mass. If you don't remember how we did molar mass, I will refresh you in just a minute. You're going to take that and multiply it by a mole-mole ratio. Then you're going to take that and multiply it by your molar mass of B in grams per mole. Now, this will not seem like it makes any kind of sense, but when you go back to do your, to set up your own problems, go back to this page because this will help you with your unit analysis. So you can check to see if you've actually set up your problems right. But we need to do an actual problem so you know what all of this mumbo jumbo means. So let's say that we have 32 grams of nitrogen gas. We want to determine how many grams of ammonia, which is NH3, that we can make. We have to do several steps. The first is calculate molar mass. For your A, and your B. So in this case, our A is equal to the nitrogen gas. That's what we already know. Our B is the unknown. So when you go back to that other slide where it had the grams of A and grams of B and all that, this is what we're talking about. So your A is your known. Your B is your unknown. We have to calculate the molar masses for each of those because we're going to need them. Then 
you write a mole mole factor. And that's going to describe how many moles of B that you make given the amount of A that you have, okay? So let's do those two things. I'm going to rewrite the equation on the next page. So that's our equation. We're starting with 32 grams of nitrogen, and we don't know how many grams of NH3 that makes. To calculate the molar mass, which I abbreviate MM, of nitrogen, you have to take the sum of all the atoms that make up this nitrogen gas. Now in this case, we've only got one type of atom, and that's the nitrogen. We'll approximate nitrogen as about 14. There are two atoms of nitrogen, so we have to multiply by two. So that gives us 28 grams per mole of nitrogen gas. If that's not familiar to you, you will have to go back to the other lecture and refresh yourself on how to calculate molar mass. The molar mass of the ammonia is a little bit more complicated. We have one nitrogen, so we'll just write that as 14. And then we have three hydrogen atoms. So we're going to multiply the atomic mass of hydrogen by three. And that will give us the total molar mass. When you do that, you get 17.024 grams per mole. And that's for our NH3. Now we need to write our mole mole factor. What we want, the internet does not like me today. It's doing all sorts of crazy things with my pen. What we want has to be on top. What we already have has to be on the bottom. And we're getting our numbers from the coefficients in our chemical equation up top. What we want information on is this uh, ammonia gas. So we're going to write out the two from the reaction, and then we're going to say that's in moles of NH3. What we have is information on the nitrogen. And since there's no number in front of the nitrogen, we assume that it's a one. So our mole mole factor is two moles of NH3 for every one mole of nitrogen gas. Now we have to set up our equation, and that's where all that long unit analysis comes from. So we're going to start with our known information, and that's 32 grams of nitrogen. We're going to multiply that by our molar mass factor. And remember, we're trying to get to moles of nitrogen. So we're going to put moles at the top and the grams on the bottom. If we stopped right here, what we'd have is moles of nitrogen. That's not quite what we want yet, though. 
we need to take the moles of nitrogen and figure out how many moles of ammonia that means. So we're going to drop in our mole-mole factor. And that was the two moles of ammonia for every one mole of nitrogen gas. If we were to stop here, we'd have moles of ammonia, the NH3. We're almost there, but that's not grand. To go from moles of NH3 to grams of NH3, we need to use the molar mass of NH3. So we're multiplying by our molar mass with the grams at the top. and the moles at the bottom. Now, we're at grams of NH3. When you do this out, you're going to be multiplying and dividing. So you're going to take the 32 grams of nitrogen and divide by 28. Then you multiply that by 2, divide by 1. It will not always be a 1 in the denominator. Then you take that and you multiply again by your molar mass, which in this case was 17.024. So try putting that into your calculator and put in what you get. Okay. So we're going to go over it all again, Sharadian, don't worry. But it's a lot of math. So we'll do it, we'll run through all of it again. So for if you can, just try using your calculator to divide. Let's see. Yep. Jayla, that's exactly what I got. Yep. Zanaya, you're good. So yeah, your calculator will tell you 38.912 grams. But we have to consider significant figures. Our given information had two sig figs. So our answer has to be two sig figs. So we're going to round this eight up to a nine. So our final answer is 39 grams of NH3. So you can't forget to put the grams or the NH3 because otherwise I won't know what it is. Now we're gonna walk through the whole thing again now that it's all here. The first thing we have to do is figure out the molar mass of each of the compounds. So that was this first step. And remember that with the molar mass, what you're doing is you're looking at the periodic table. So if we're looking at the molar mass of nitrogen gas, we get the molar mass of the element nitrogen from the periodic table. So that's where those numbers come from, Charadiate. They come from the periodic table. I would definitely suggest that if the molar mass thing was like, wait, what? Go back and review the other lecture because we're gonna be using molar mass for the rest of chapter seven. So you use the periodic table. It has the atomic mass. When you express that in grams per mole, then it becomes a molar mass. You add up all the atoms that you have in your compound, and that gives you the molar mass of the compound. So we did that for nitrogen, and we did that for ammonia, which is NH3. The next step was to figure out what our mole-mole factor was. We're trying to go from nitrogen to ammonia. So we need to have ammonia on the top because it's what we want. We want moles of ammonia so that we can convert that to grams. We get the moles from the equation at the top. So there's two moles of ammonia here because there's a two in front of the ammonia in the equation. For the nitrogen, 
we said it's a one because there's no number in front of the nitrogen. So you assume that it's a one. So that's how we get the numbers. And then we put them there because what we want has to be over what we have for the math to make sense. Then we have to string all of these things together and do a big old calculation. The first step, you're taking the grams of nitrogen and converting it to moles. So on that front sheet, let me use a different color here. We'll use purple. So we're converting, this is the grams of A to moles of A if you go back to look at that other sheet. Then you're using your mole-mole ratio or mole-mole factor. Different textbooks call it different things. So that's your mole-mole factor. And that's gonna take you from moles of A to moles of B. In this case, our A, our known is the nitrogen and we're converting to our B, which is moles of ammonia. That leaves us with moles of ammonia. Almost there, but the question asks for the number of grams. So if you stop there, that's not the answer. So you have to take the molar mass of ammonia and, and multiply by the number of moles that you have to get the number of grams. This is almost as complicated as it gets. The best thing you can do is practice and to have a set system and method for how you approach these problems. You'll see I literally do it the same way every time because I don't want to forget any small details. If you leave out a number, if you flip something, that will give you a different answer and it will be wrong. So we have another one of these problems that I'm going to walk you through. And again, it's a lot of math. So if math like makes you sad, it makes you want to crawl into bed, I apologize. But it doesn't have to be that way. So please reach out to me if it does make you want to scream and pull your hair out, because we don't want that for you. So with this next example, we're going to go back to our trusty old iron-3 oxide. We have a number of grams of iron-3 oxide, and we need to know how many grams of oxygen do we need to make that much. So I'm going to go to a new page. I'm going to rewrite the equation, and then we're going to solve the problem together. Alrighty, so here's our equation. We have iron plus oxygen gas producing iron three oxide. And just as an aside, you should be able to name um, this compound. Okay. You should be able to name that based on what we did with the naming in chapter six. So just as a review, be able to name that. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to rewrite the question. We had 45.8 grams of iron three oxide. And what we want to know is how many grams of oxygen do we need to make all of that product? First part, we figure out our molar mass. So the molar mass of the iron two or iron three oxide, excuse me, we're going to look at the periodic table to find iron and oxygen, you'll see that iron is 55.845 grams per mole. 
we have two of those because of the subscript. So we have to multiply that atomic mass by two. We add to it the three oxygens that we have. Each of those weighs 15.999 grams per mole. We multiply that by three. What you should get for that is 159.687 grams per mole. I'm squeezing that in there tight, so I hope you can read it. The next molar mass we have to calculate is oxygen. That one's pretty simple. There are two oxygen atoms, so we multiply the 15.99 grams per mole by two. And when you do that, you should get 31.998 grams per mole. Now, if you approximate 15.999 as 16, no harm, no foul, okay? It's a lot easier to do that and say two times 16 is 32 than to go to your calculator. You won't be wrong. You're not going to have an answer that's far off just because you approximated 15.999 as 16. So that's just an FYI. So we found our molar masses. Those are what we're going to use later on. Now we have to write our mole-mole factor. Now here's your quiz. We have to do want over have. So am I going to have something about oxygen in the top, or am I going to have something about the iron-3 oxide? You can write um, iron or oxygen. In the, in the chat box. What goes on top? Okay, so we have some votes for oxygen. Anybody else want to vote? Okay. So it looks like we're still not quite understanding. Oh. I'm not understanding because I'm looking at my own work incorrectly. I'm glad y'all are paying attention. Yeah, this question, we want oxygen. So we're going to use the coefficient for oxygen, which is 3. And then we're going to do the coefficient for the iron 3 oxide on the bottom because that's what we already have. So hopefully that color coding helps. So now we have our mole-mole factor. Now we have to set up this crazy equation. So what we're going to do, I'm going to write it out in the units, and then we'll write out the numbers. So we're going to go from grams of iron 3 oxide to moles of iron 3 oxide. Then we're going to go from there to moles of oxygen. This, we're going to use our molar mass for the first part. We're going to use our mole to mole factor to go from the, the product, the iron 3 oxide, to oxygen. Then we're going to use the molar mass of oxygen to go from moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. So let's fill in some numbers. We started with 45.8 grams of iron 2O3. Okay. We're going to take our molar mass, which we calculated to be 
159.687. And that number is going to go on the bottom because we're trying to get rid of grams. On the top, we're going to put moles of iron 3 oxide because that's what we're trying to get to. Now we need to take that and use our mole-mole factor. We determine that was going to be three moles of oxygen over two moles of the iron three oxide. Can you all still see that okay? My pen is messing up a bit. So let me know if it's unclear. I can try to rewrite some of it. The final leg of this is to take the moles of oxygen and convert to grams of oxygen. We said that our molar mass that we calculated was 31.998 grams of oxygen for every one mole. And the reason we're putting the grams in the top is because that's what we want to end up with. So try putting that into your calculator, and let's see what you get. When you have something, you can throw it in the chat box. 13.8. That's what I got too. And that's with six eggs. So your calculator probably said something like 13.766 something. So you should get 13.8 grams of oxygen. I'm going to sound like a broken record. You have to practice these problems. If you don't practice, you will be lost. This, this is your first time seeing this. If you didn't do this kind of um, chemistry problem solving in high school chemistry, or if you didn't take high school chemistry, this will be very foreign to you. And there's a lot of pieces you have to put together to go from grams of one thing to grams of another. Okay. So we've got one more problem that we'll be able to do. We're not going to be able to finish everything from Chapter 7. I kind of had a feeling we wouldn't, but this is the, the large majority of what you need to understand for this chapter. Doing these problems summarizes most everything in terms of the math we've been doing about moles and Avogadro's number, molar mass, all of those things. If you can't do those, then you can't do these problems. So we'll go through one more problem, and I'll stop a few times along the way to get your input just to see where we are. Okay. So here we have a reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas producing 13.1 grams of water. And the question is asking how many grams of oxygen reacted? So to rephrase this, we're going to have 13.1 grams of water goes to how many grams of oxygen. I'm not going to write out how to get to the molar masses um, because it's just for space and time's sake. But again, review the lecture from last week on Tuesday. It's up on YouTube. I'll put a reminder when I post this um, recording. I'll put a reminder in the link so that you can see all the lectures from now forward. 
So, the molar mass of water, and you can quiz yourself on this later, but the molar mass of water is 18.015 grams per mole. And the molar mass of oxygen We just did that, and we said it was 31.998 grams per mole. Now we need to write our mole-mole factor. What is going to be at the top of our mole-mole factor? You can write it in the chat box. So some number of moles of something is going to be at the top. What is that going to be? Remember what we want is the oxygen. So it's going to have something to do with oxygen on the top, right? We need to fill in the numbers. So it's going to be one mole of O2 gas. Right. I was waiting for the full answer, like one mole. I know it's oxygen. Now on the bottom, what are we going to have for the bottom? and tell me number of moles and what the compound is. Yep, I see it. Right, two moles of water. So that's gonna be our mole-mole factor. I got you, you're good. Now we have to string this whole mess together so that we can go from grams of water to grams of oxygen. We're starting with 13.1 grams of water. We're going to convert that to moles of water. That means we want moles in the top. and the molar mass we calculated for water in the bottom. Then we're going to take the moles of water and multiply by our mole-mole factor. This will get us to moles of oxygen. To go from moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen, we need our molar mass. That we figured out was 31.998 grams of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen that we have. When you put that into your calculator, you should get something that looks like this, 11.8 six, three, four grams. That doesn't take into account significant figures. So our initial information had three sig figs. So how do we report this number 11.634 as three significant figures? Eleven point six, right. So we have eleven point six grams of oxygen that reacted 
to make the 13.1 grams of water. So the final thing that we have to cover is limiting reagents and percent yield. We'll talk about what the limiting reagent means, but we're not going to, we probably won't really have time to do problems. So everybody knows what a grilled cheese sandwich is. If you make a grilled cheese, you need a couple of slices of bread, you need at least two slices of cheese. Because if you tell me you put one slice of cheese on a grilled cheese sandwich, I'm going to look at you like you have five heads. I better at least have two slices of cheese. If we were to write this out as a chemical equation and just assume that bread and cheese are elements that we can write, you need two slices of bread, two pieces of cheese, and that makes one sandwich. Now we're not going to talk about the fact that you need a little bit of butter so you can get a little bit of brown on both sides. We'll, we'll leave that out of the equation because that makes it too messy. But you better use some butter on that grilled cheese. Okay. If I told you that I have 20 slices of bread and I had eight slices of cheese, how many sandwiches can I make? Complete whole sandwiches. Well, I have 20 slices of bread, which means that I could make 10 sandwiches if I was just thinking about the bread. If I was just thinking about the cheese, well, I need two slices per sandwich. So that means that I can make four. If I combine these two, the 20 slices of bread plus the eight slices of cheese, I can only make four sandwiches because I've only got enough cheese for four. That means that the cheese would be our limiting reagent. It's the one that runs out first. It's a silly example, but if you get stuck, this is what you should come back to. So the next time you have a grilled cheese, and don't lie, unless you're lactose intolerant, you're going to have a grilled cheese again in your life. If you have a ton of bread, a whole loaf of bread, but you only have two pieces of cheese, you're only going to make one sandwich and call it done. You've got extra bread. So when we're doing these limiting reactant questions, the question is, which one of the reactants limits how much product you can make? So a limiting reactant is the substance that's used up first. That's the cheese in our example. And it limits the amount of product you can form. You can only make the amount of sandwiches that you can actually complete. The reactant that doesn't completely react, so you have some extra, is called the excess reagent. So in our example, the bread was the excess reagent because we had 20 slices of that. And the limiting reagent was the cheese. Cheese ain't cheap. We only had eight slices, so we could only make four sandwiches. We can do the same kind of calculations that we just did with the going from the grams or the moles to the number of moles or grams of something else, and we can do that to figure out which reactant is limiting. We just have to do the same type of problem twice. So you calculate the amount of product possible when all of your reactant is completely consumed. So if you have a plus B makes C, and you have three grams of A and two grams of B, you need to do calculations to figure out how many grams of C you can make. 
So you do the same kind of mole mole factor, figure out how many grams of C you make, do the same conversions with B to C, and then you see which one is less. You figure out which reactant is going to run out first because that's the one that's going to make the smaller amount of product. So I'll show you, I think we have time for me to just show you this, but I'm not going to make this question, um, I'm not gonna have you do a limiting reactant question, but you will have to do the um, converting from grams of one thing to grams of another for your homework. So that, it's just gonna be one of those problems, and I'm gonna want you to show all your work. But if you can stick with me, I'll show you how this works. We're only doing moles, so it should be a lot quicker for this problem. So you have three moles of carbon monoxide. And you have five moles of hydrogen gas. The question is, how many moles of methanol can you make? And which one is the limiting reactant. I will abbreviate limiting reactant as LR. So let's deal with the carbon monoxide first. For our mole-mole ratio or factor, and this is for the carbon monoxide, Um, that's CH3OH is the same thing as CH4O, but this is how someone with the more of a chemistry lean would write it. So again, old habits, they die hard. Um, so we have to write a mole-mole factor that describes how many moles of carbon monoxide um, will make however many moles of methanol, which is the CH4O. We look at our chemical equation there's no coefficient in front of either of them. So that means that we're gonna imply that each of those is a one. What we want is gonna be on top of what we have. So what we want is the CH4O. What we already have information for is the carbon monoxide. We're gonna take that and multiply by the number of moles of carbon monoxide that we have. And when you do that, you should get an answer that cancels out the moles of carbon monoxide and leaves you with moles of methanol. So you're going to get three moles. Now we have to do the same thing, but we do it with the hydrogen. Your want over half is the same one mole of methanol. And this time, the hydrogen, there's a two in front of it in the chemical reaction. So we're gonna write two moles of hydrogen gas. We're gonna take that and multiply by the amount of hydrogen that we have, which is five moles. When you do this in your calculator, you're going to have five divided by two, which gives you 2.5 moles of methanol. That means that's how much we're going to make because it's the lower number. And that hydrogen is the limiting reagent. You can only make enough, you can only make the amount of methanol that your hydrogen will allow. It's the limiting reactant. So we're going to do more with that on Thursday to finish this up and um, 
we're going to have an exam. I'm going to talk with Dr. Gravely because we're behind with all the ca class cancellations and stuff like that. So we're going to have to make some adjustments to the schedule. Um, the, the exam will be online. You're going to need to have access to a desktop or a laptop. And we're going to use the Respondus Lockdown um, software so that, you know, all you can do is focus on the exam. Please don't have anyone in the room with you when you take it. We'll go over all of this um, bef right before exam time. But it'll be during the normal time that we have class. You have the same amount of time, and you can ask me questions. So um, we'll talk more about that next time once I get some more information. But right now, just do like we've been doing. There's going to be a homework assignment. I think it may already be posted, but I'm going to have to modify it because we didn't get all the way through. So we'll pick up here with limiting reactants, and then we'll move through the rest of Chapter 7, and then we'll talk about an exam. If you have questions, you can email me. If you have concerns about the math, email me office hours, all those types of things. The assignment will be due tomorrow, which is Wednesday by noon. So you can still do office hours and send me emails and stuff like that if you try it tonight and then you still don't understand it. So good luck. If you have any questions, you can hang around and put them in the chat. Otherwise, have a good one.